I'll tell one story about which I, I shouldn't. We got over the North Sea and I had my suspicions of my oxygen supply, which we take from 10,000 feet up, you have your, you turn your oxygen on. I thought, I'm not getting all the oxygen I, I need. And it was showing I was not controlling the aircraft. The flight engineer came up and said, are you right, Skipper? I said, oh, don't know about the oxygen. And he grabbed my oxygen tube and followed all the way around and said, and came back and said, here it is, the split in it. He'd come within seconds of us disappearing in the North Sea. Warning, the frontline testimony you're about to hear is, at times, extremely graphic. The realities of war are often difficult, but it's vitally important that these stories are told and the lessons are learned. Your discretion is advised. I was a Lancaster pilot in World War II. Our aircraft was Q Queenie, so we always saw to her as our Queenie as a girlfriend. To, to counter the, the German fighters, we, we formed groups of four aircraft, a lead, two SI, and one of the bot. And <coughs> they all always went together instead of a single aircraft. They could then conceived the idea was, why don't we put all those four aircraft together in a line? You, you have one up the top, down, 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 then go up, up, up. And there's a long line of perhaps up to a hundred uh, um, aircraft. And they're all throwing out the window, the metallic paper that nullifies the German radar. They, it, it, it's the same as an aircraft. In other words, <coughs> having that big column is a huge mass of, of this radar. If the uh, anti-aircraft is close to your aircraft, your aircraft rocks around and you, you, it, <coughs> you get this sort of thing flying through the aircraft. Uh, To, to be hit, you, you know that you, you've had a, you've got a problem. Uh, something, there's a terrible noise. You find that the control of the aircraft is affected in some way and you've got to correct it. Um, and that's the, the major thing about it. Flak is, close flak is really terrible. Uh, uh, I've seen some aircraft being caught with flak and completely explode. You see this huge explosion and you see parachutes shooting out all over the place. It's uh, awe-inspiring. It's not a thing you want to talk about. It's, uh, we were safe from fighters because our fighters had got conquered the Germans. They had they always went ahead of us and beat up the aerodromes where the German fighters were going to fly from. The chap that formed out four, he was from a, a neighbouring squadron. His navigator convinced his pilot that the lead had gone too far. We were going in a column like this. We do a right-hand turn one minute into the target. And he said he, he's, he's, he's gone past the turn-off point. So this chap says, well, 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 we'll turn off. So our four turned off out of the column and we were running parallel to the lead. He's out here. We were now subject to all the flak and they picked it on us all the time. And uh, uh, it wasn't long before some of us hit Al. Number three was hit and he went down. It hit number four and those were the only two aircraft that were lost in that raid, those two. The rear gunner, when he 
was in flak area, kept his head down below his guns to, for protection. And he lifted his head to watch this aircraft collider go down. And as he did, whew, something went through the flak through him. But up in front, I was getting pasted a bit, and that bit of flak came through the window up here and caught me right there. Right there. And uh, my head knocked the steel plate at the back. And I was stunned for a moment. But what I did was I looked at my hand, which was on the throttles, and I wiggled my fingers. I said, I'm all right. So I carried on flying and uh, we, um, uh, we, we, we finished our bobby run and got out of it. But um, my problem was, I was now blood everywhere. Uh, the flight engineer got a, a pad and put it in my uh, oxygen mask. But then I, I couldn't talk. They couldn't understand me. So I had to write little notes for him for the rest of the trip. <laughs> anyway, we did in our time 38 trips to Germany. On our first trip, which was a night trip, we went to Essen. Now, how, going there on our first one was absolutely a, a, a shock. I, I couldn't get used to the fact that the other aircraft were around us. I couldn't see them. I didn't know where I was going to hit them. There was the flak, there was the searchlights, and so on. And when I got home afterwards, I th thought, if I've got to go through this another 29 times, I'll go around the bend. And things looked a, a, a hell of a lot better. I could see where all the other aircraft were. I could see what the flak looked like. It just was, well, what I could say is I could, I'll put up with this, uh, I'll cope. And so we went on from there. We did our our trips and so on. Um, Twenty uh, thirty eight trips. Ten, ten were uh, night trips, and they got to the stage where the RAF wanted to increase firepower over Germany. They increased the tour from uh, 24 ops to 30 ops. And it so happened that we had to do 30 ops. We got to 38 and they reduced the, the score back to 30. So the CO says, you're, you're finished, clear of the station and so on. Well, the first thing we did was to um, gather the ground crew, four, four in number that looked after the aircraft, take them down to the local pub and, and get some beer into them and to thank them for their efforts because they had to put up with some terrible weather to keep the aircraft fit and so on. Um, I went off on final leave and instead of a, a fortnight, I think I had 13 weeks. <laughs> they, they, they couldn't get my next move ready because I said I would go into transport command. You, you've got a, a cover of chaps, seven or eight, which are responsible, you're responsible for. All you know is you've got to get through there right or wrong and uh, it's <laughs> it, it, it it does affect some chaps they, they have to give it away they, they can't stand it but uh, all you've got to do is steal your mind and go through it it doesn't last that long it's just a few minutes gone 
it's a responsibility which, when I think about it now, is probably too great for what I should have, what I was taken. But uh, that was the measure of the chaps that did it. it. Not all of them could go. Some of them gave it gave away, said, we can't stand this. But it, uh, at the time, it's scary. But it, if your memory erases it, you can go on with it and so on. It's a... Uh, um, I've got a photograph somewhere where we've got the holes in the side of the aircraft, the gashes and so forth. We didn't receive a lot of damage. Uh, it's uh, Some aircraft, of course, had big pieces knocked off and so forth. We never did. We never lost an engine. Uh, we certainly got some holes, but that's about all. Yeah. So what what we did as crew, oh, that's a scarecrow. Germans have got a, a, a special thing which they shoot up like that to scare us. And uh, in other words, it's an imitation they, that we believe, and that sets our mind at rest. We don't have to worry about those chaps that have just perished. It's... Uh, it's just one way of trying to live with it. Yes. Yeah. We became the the leading aircraft of our squadron. If 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 the squadron was going to fly anywhere, we did the lead. Th that went into to the raids as well, so that when our squadron. Other squadrons from the from the uh, group were on a raid. Our our squadron had a turn at leading, which meant that our aircraft was the one right out in front there, and we had that on several occasions. So it's uh, was, was, was quite a big thing for us. Yeah, there were some operations where. With a very little opposition, so uh, to a man will damn. Yeah. Uh, what about that one? We were, were supposed to to uh, <coughs> attack it, but they withdrew us uh, before we could drop any bombs there. Uh, On occasions, we, I remember, uh, we had to fly across the channel at low level. In other words, we were going to attack something close to the coast and we we're going to sort of keep below their radar. But we'd only gone, what, halfway, and we were recalled because the fighters that were going to uh, uh, Attaches, they could not take off because of fog, so that was a a raid that didn't take place. We we had all intention, but uh, we had to come back, and um, and of course if you if you come back and you've got a cookie on board, a cookie is a four thousand pounder. You, you do not land with a cookie on, because you may thump in and the thing drops and. You, so what what you do, you have a special area in the North Sea which you go and drop that in there. And, uh, it is seems that, a terrible waste, but ever. <laughs> is that area called Denmark? <laughs> it could be. <laughs> uh, I hope there's no fishermen there. What about the cookies hitting the snow? You could see the effect of them when you dropped them. Oh, the, the effect of... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, a cookie when it drops in the snow, the, the ripples are going... You, you know what water's like when you... It's like that, but it's quick. You know, oh, 
you're talking about you you could see the bomb the explosion yeah yeah but uh oh yes it's uh could you please and of course there's a time when a bomb won't leave your aircraft the the flight engineer could get down on the steps open the little gate and look in along the bomb bay there's the bomb and so what you do then is you start doing this sort of and you get it dropped off yeah the the 500 pounder was the standard bomb that you could you could carry all 500 pounders depending on what the target was you could also carry uh, what we call incendiaries, well, they were in big boxes and so on. The idea was that if you had a cookie, you dropped it, it, it shattered it, and then the incendiaries came in and set fire to it all and so on. And that was only the three types we had. Uh, and, uh, it's a tall story of when we landed at an American aerodrome and had had to wait before we could take off again and we had the bag doors open. And the Americans came along and looked at it and they were absolutely amazed at the size of the bomb bay in the um, uh, Lancaster. Of course, in a, uh, uh, a fortress, the bombs are... are uh, vertical, and they don't take up so much room. Ours are horizontal, and uh, these Americans were absolutely aghast at the size of the. Uh, they realised then that we carried a, a hell of a lot more fuel uh, um, ammunition than they did. But, uh, yeah, the targets we were after, three by three group were oil targets. They were <coughs> fuel tanks, fuel refineries, full storage, anything that would cut down the uh, oil supplies to the German fighters. And the, <coughs> the Germans themselves in writing say that that was a, a very big effort. And uh, it's... Uh, well worth the trial. Like the other Bible groups were after towns, knocking buildings down and so forth, and we were a three group after the fuel. We were too high up. We, we were up 20,000 feet. And uh, you've got to remember, some of this was at night. So in daytime, we could see things, yes. And, uh, but... Uh, I couldn't because I'm sitting here flying and it's underneath me down there. Uh, some of the other crew could put their heads out and look and see it, but not me. Yeah. Yeah. The nighttime ones were far more concentration. You, you, you had instruments and you were watching them closely. Daytime, you're sitting there looking around and so forth, you are more relaxed. <coughs> but, uh, you had more chance of hitting the daytime ones than the nighttime ones. Uh, so we had the effect of every time you press the, the bomb button, a camera starts going and it's taking shots along your bombing run and you see it finally comes to one where it says your bomb has landed. Uh, they all always were looked at by the ground crew. In their mess we used to put the, the um, uh, photos up so they could see it and each compare one aircraft against the other and so on. And um, I always remember we had the, it was night time and we were, it was oil tanks I think, and we got the perfect photograph and 
the CEO was taking it around and showing all his buddies. So <laughs> said, this is what we do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it really is the, the moment before the bomb hit. The, the cabinet tells you that's where the bomb's going to go. And then certainly in one of those uh, daylight trips, we, we were to bomb the marshalling yards at Cologne. And our photograph showed, so help me God, the cathedral in our bombing photograph. And I thought, oh, we've damaged the cathedral. And when Joan and I were traveling around Europe, we stopped at Cologne. I got a hold of the um, uh, driver and said, that ha has the, ca the um, cathedral got any damage to the war? He says, just a little. I told him what had happened. The fact was that if your camera does a little that way or that way, of course it goes down there, goes down there. It, it included the, and we, our bombs didn't hit it at all. <laughs> but I was very relieved. <laughs> yeah. The few that we did for, were, were getting on our tail. They were going to attack us from the stern. I wouldn't see them, but the rear gunner would see it and he'd describe it coming in. And when he did, we did a, what we call a corkscrew action. We, if he's coming in in this way, we, we turn the aircraft over, go down like that, roll it like that, up like that, over like that, roll it again, and you're doing this corkscrew. The Germans don't carry on. It's, it's hopeless for them to shoot. And that's what, what takes place. Uh, the, the, the rear gunner is describing what, what the aircraft is doing to you. It, uh, you're doing this corkscrew. Yeah. The Lancaster was the, the best aircraft I ever flew. Oh, it was marvellous. Uh, it's... It's big, but uh, the point was, w we flew um, uh, a bigger plane to start with. The Sterling. Uh, the Sterling. Sterling. It, it, it looked f far bigger and not so graceful. And you go to the, to the Lancaster, and it's smaller, and it's neater, and it's faster. And it's, it's got everything that goes with it. Oh, it's a beautiful aircraft. We in our aircraft had an extra gunner. Of course, we had a, a, what we call a mid-under gunner. He's underneath. You have the, the rear gunners, the four, the mid-upper gunner, and you have the, the front gunner as well. Um, we, we never flew in daylights with the mid-under gunner because you wouldn't get attacked during the daylight. But at night, you could get detected. And what the Germans were doing at night was they, they're, this is the area, they're under here, and they come in in the dark, which you can't see, and they've got the upward firing guns, they go to a, a wing and just shoot into the wing, which was all fuel tanks, and in seconds, the whole thing's aflame. And that's... and. That was the reason we had the the, the rear, the mid under gunner. Probably our longest trip was when we went to Dresden. Dresden is way in the east of uh, Germany, and the Russians had asked for help. They wanted uh, some effort from us to help them over there. Anyway, we had this raid. The first wave went in at 10 o'clock. We went in at 2 in the morning, and the Americans went in the daylight. So it was quite a massive uh, trip. But what the one thing that struck me when I read it was that the nearest fighter station to Dresden couldn't take off because they had no fuel. And I thought, well, at least we, we did some good. And... Uh, Yes, and that was towards the end of our tour. Uh, 
when, when they reduced the tour from uh, 40 back to 30, we of course had finished at 38. So it's get the ground crew together, down to the local pub, fill them with beer and thank them for the, their, their efforts and so forth. And, uh, and I just want to be clear, the piece of flak that you're holding, yeah, that's the same exact one that hit you. Oh, this, this, this flak is the one that was in my face. It was right, right there. Yep, yeah. How did you end up getting it? It, it? it it hit there and dropped on the floor. And the flight engineer picked it up. Uh, it, it couldn't launch in my face because I had a pair, pair of um, ordinary glasses, big Air Force glasses, an oxygen mask, and so forth, which has a microphone in it, it's quite a massive thing. It it couldn't it penetrated to to cut the skin, but then it it dropped away. It couldn't lodge there. We were going to fly Dakotas as supply to the Far East, uh, however, uh, I had to crew up. The new crew was one navigator and a wireless operator. The navigator was a New Zealander, and uh, we did the ground study, got to the aerodrome, started playing with the aircraft, and the navigator said, no, I'm not going to put up with this. So he pulled out, and I get a bit disillusioned with navigators. Anyway, <coughs> we had to go back and do the fortnights uh, work again and uh, we were about to go to the flying school to start flying the uh, Dakota when three things happened Germany surrendered I got a bar to my DFC and the Prime Minister says I want all air crew all troops home by Christmas 45 so that was the end of that. Uh, I, I had planned to, to go on to Transport Command. They said, no, you, you're not required now. And uh, we went up to uh, Midlands to catch our troop ship. It was the Multan that we had uh, quite a few Polish troops that wanted to go home, and there was a lot of New Zealanders and, and uh, Australians. And we took off, and we first stop was Alexandra, and there was New Zealand nurses were coming up the gangplank and they were talking. And I struck me, what a terrible accent they've got, because I mean, I'd had years of other accents and so forth. Anyway, it wasn't terrible, it was just unusual. Anyway, the, the Polish were dropped off at, in Italy and uh, we proceeded to, to uh, have a stop in Australia, Fremantle, and uh, from there on we, we came home and uh, a thing happened there that uh, my old false uh, headmaster, Fritz Martin Renner, was retiring and he rung my dad and said, uh, is Ken home yet? I, I want him to come to my, my farewell dinner. And dad says, no, he's still three or four days away in, a, in the boat. <laughs> so I, I missed that altogether there. Anyway, <coughs> well, we got home, and uh, my two brothers <coughs> were there for Christmas, and that's the first time we've been together for some years. Uh, I was put onto a reserve, uh, 
as far as I know, I still might be called upon to fight the next war, but I'm not sure. <laughs> you, you've always had this good sense of humour? You've always had such a good sense? Oh, yes. You, you must have a sense of humour. Yes. I, I don't admire anyone that didn't have one, but... Uh, yeah. No, you, you've got to have a sense of humour. <laughs> got to be able to laugh and so forth. Yep. You're a decorated war hero. You've done a lot in your life. You've seen a lot. What is some advice you would like to give to your future generations? Oh. One thing that bugs me is that youngsters take to drink very early. And that's the thing I think is quite wrong. Uh, sure, occasional drinks, but uh, they become consistent drinkers and perpetual drinkers. And I think that has a lot to uh, killing off our youngsters early. Uh, and drugs, uh, I'm proud of that. Absolutely, none at all. However, it doesn't make me out a good good fellow at all. It's just I, I won't take to these things or keep steer of them. In fact, I, I haven't had a beer for uh, ages. Yet, it, when the Air Force, beer was the usual drink. You know, you had to be in to drink beer and so on. Uh, but, uh, what kind of man do you want people to always remember you as? As what kind of man? A good family man is what I would like to be remembered by. Um, and uh, if, if, if for that, life's worth living. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.